But the goal of ministry is always the same, isn't it? It's to shepherd the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made us overseers. That goal doesn't change, but the context in which we exercise that ministry does change. And we've all experienced that over the last few months and we're all continuing to experience it. And we thought it would be great to interview three people who are ministering in differing contexts to ask them a little bit about how they're exercising that goal in a changing environment, to learn from them, perhaps to prompt some questions and to be encouraged at what the Lord is doing. So first of all, it's great joy to welcome Ephraim. Ephraim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and the context you're ministering in? Hi, hi everyone. My name is Ephraim, Ephraim Buckle. Um, basically in ministry, I wear two hats. Um, firstly, I'm a pastor of a church in South East London, in Lewisham. The church is called Ecclesia. Um, planted it uh, around uh, 16, 17 years ago. And we're based on a, a small housing estate just um, in central Lewisham there. Um, my other hat is working as director of training and mentoring for London City Mission, um, which is a mission agency supporting the Church of London to reach those who are the least reached communities in the city. And so we have missionaries in virtually every borough um, working with churches, um, reaching out to the least reach of the city. Now, Ephraim, you, like lots of churches, have been running live streams on a Sunday morning, which are great at one level, but they don't really enable us to connect well together, don't they? What are some of the issues in terms of connecting and how have you been addressing those? Um, I guess the first issue was just working out how to do it. It's not something that we had done before. We struggled with the technology. Um, at first, we we try on different platforms, different cameras, etc., um, fundamentally, we decided on having the, uh, the church as a kind of studio base where we would stream from. And then we had the challenge of people being able to connect with Zoom. Um, the more elderly within our congregation found it difficult to have to download an app and set up an ID and then click on a link and put in a password and so on. And so we then um, started transmitting or streaming to YouTube to make it easier to access. So they just click on one link and then it's there, they can see it. Um, that had its detractions because it meant that there wasn't the same kind of feel of community among the church members. Um, in Zoom, everyone can interact on the chat and see who else is on and so on. You don't get it on YouTube. So it's been pros and cons in that regard. And um, especially trying to consider those who uh, don't have a smartphone maybe or don't have a computer um, you know we've had to try and work hard at um, keeping in touch and also on a pastoral level the the challenges of being able to actually see people and get a, a really good sense of where they're at um, rather than trying to achieve that through messages and phone calls um, if somebody's in a difficult space and they're trying to you know um, remain out of reach um, it's a lot easier for them to do that. And so there have been the odd occasion where we've had to kind of pop around to see someone and have, try and have a doorstep conversation just to make sure that they're okay. But these have definitely been some of the challenges that we've had to be working through as far as that's concerned. I, I guess some groups in particular are very isolated and continue to be even under the new rules. Uh, what are your experiences of, of, of helping to reach and connect with some of those particularly isolated groups, Ephraim? Yeah, that's been a real issue um, within the work of London City Mission and the missionaries working around town. Um, fundamentally, you've got missionaries, for example, who would be used to frequenting care homes, nursing homes, and with the, the necessity for shielding, it's meant that they've not been able to have that access. And so in many cases, they've had to just resort to letter writing, um, whether by hand or by computer, but just dropping the letters through the door and using that as a means of staying in touch, dropping cards and so on. Um, there have been a few doorstep conversations where missionaries have been supporting lo local food banks and, you know, delivering food to the doorstep and then been having, been able to have a conversation at, at the end of the path. Um, and uh, there are a couple of our missionaries who are working in King, King's Cross, for example, and they're working with the street population there, which is normally a transient um, community that they would really connect with in person. They would kind of know the hangouts and so on. And many of them don't have smartphones and so on. And so what they've 
taken to doing is in addition to just making phone calls and trying to connect that way um some have even been burning cds with with messages and um, music and inspirational items that they can just put in their cd player because they don't have access to the internet and youtube links and so on and so forth so it, it's meant some quite ingenious um creative uh, approaches um, just like the, the those who are working with youth groups and they've been doing online gaming tournaments. And in doing that, they, they've had a short devotion whilst all of the young people are connected with their headsets. And then they, you know, facilitate the tournament and then they can point towards uh, a Zoom Bible study. And uh, a couple of our missionaries have actually said that they've had a really good engagement um, from young people who have actually con connected with the Zoom Bible studies and found that a, a really accessible way for them to actually um, get involved in, um, in interacting with the Bible. And so, um, yeah, we're definitely seeing some um, hopeful signs there. It's whatever works, really. Indeed. T tell us a little bit about funerals, Ephraim, because um, so far we've been allowed to have funerals, of course, but they've had to be very small. And they can be a bit bigger now, up to 30 people in England. Um, it's different in different countries. Um, but tell us particularly about some of the challenges that you see in terms of helping people to grieve well. Yeah, um, it has been particularly difficult. Um, in the, the black community, we have quite strong customs and traditions as it relates to funerals and what happens in a time of bereavement. Um, bereavement is very much a community experience. And so therefore they, you know, for example, in the, in the Caribbean community, they have a thing called the nine nights and fundamentally people will go around the house every night um, once the person's passed and that will carry on typically for nine nights, but, but often right up until the funeral. And in that time, there's support, there's prayers, um, there's singing together, there's reminiscing, there's lamenting, um, people bring food and drinks and, you know, help prepare for the funeral and et cetera. And so that's been almost totally eliminated by reason of COVID. And so it's not just the attendance to the funeral or even the, the reception that's um, extended to guests after the funeral, but even leading up to the funeral. And so people have again tried to shift that to a remote experience and albeit being, you know, it's a poor substitute, it, it has provided an outlet but just helping people, one of the most common things I think I've done is helping people to just manage their expectations and to um, really come to terms with the circumstances. Um, bereavement is difficult and terrible at the best of times, and that can be hard to take in and to come to terms with, let alone not feeling that able to grieve in the way that you would. And so helping people to accept, look, this is what it is, but you can always prepare for a, a memorial service where you can have a, a more corporate supported sense of closure at a later date. There's nothing to say that that can't happen. So even though this is limited and restrictive, um, you can come together when restrictions, in the hope that restrictions are, are relaxed further still and, and have something um, that's, that's more in keeping with what you would be used to. And so it's about trying to find those glimpses of grace really. As, as it relates to just the whole experience of bereavement and funerals, etc. Thanks, Ephraim. That's really helpful. And, and that may have raised questions for you about how you connect. And we've got a, a live Q&A at the end of these recorded sessions. We'd love to try and answer some of your questions. So please, if you're watching live, do send them in if you have them. And we're not just called to connect with people, of course, we're called to care for them as well. So I'm delighted that Sonia Crossley has been able to join us. Sonia, again, tell us a little bit about yourself and the ministry um, that you have in Sheffield. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Sonia Crossley. I'm in Sheffield, in the west end of Sheffield. Um, I'm a pastoral worker here. Um, there's a team of us that do that. And my kind of area of focus is developing a biblical counselling ministry. So I do some biblical counselling and I'm trying to train up a team of others who are good at that too. Um, simply, it's just the business of trying to connect uh, the truths of God's word and the gospel to the nitty gritty of everyday life, the things that everybody struggles with uh, under normal circumstances, 
and of which much more has been going on in recent months. So we've been busy. Now, um, when lockdown began, did you just take everything you were doing face to face and put it online or was it was there a different strategy, Sonia? Yeah, it's been quite a steep learning curve. We've learned a lot as we've gone along. Um, I mean, obviously, the nature of counselling is that you're meeting in the flesh face to face um, and there's a joy in that. Um, I think some people on our team have found that really easy to transition to doing it online via Zoom or whatever. Um, they actually quite like it. It feels more focused. Um, there's less distractions going on and they can get through a session a bit more effectively. Others of us have struggled with it. I think we miss the sort of nonverbal cues of being in a room together and picking up what's going on around somebody, um, having those times where you're just perhaps just looking, out, looking away or concentrating on something else. We found it quite hard to stay focused um, for usually an hour and 20 minutes was what our sessions were before. So, yeah, something that's changed um, during this period has been that we've kind of recognised whether you're on the receiving end or the giving end of this um, kind of input, you get fatigued. And so we've tried to kind of trim it down to its bare bones. What, what do we need to do and how can we make it a bit more efficient? So we've managed to whittle it down to kind of half an hour, maybe 40 minute sessions where we're trying to be a bit more streamlined and focused. We're perhaps giving people a bit more homework stuff to reflect on between sessions where they're maybe thinking about some things that before they might have done with us but actually they're now doing that at home and coming back with their reflections on that um, so that's been interesting and then we've also um, just used the opportunity to kind of develop um, a way of dropping the counseling word and perhaps making it easier for people just to be connected up and have a conversation with that pastoral edge to it so we've offered um, even one-off phone calls for people where they can just phone and chat to someone offload and know that someone's going to pray for them. We try and encourage all our team members to make sure they pray at the end of the phone call uh, and that can be followed up with a repeat or it can just be a one-off session. Um, so it's been exciting to see uh, the team kind of adapt to the new circumstances. I, I guess some of that is having to adapt and, and, and compromise at some stage. But will there be some of those things that you'll carry forward once you're able to meet face to face? I really think so. Yeah, I think the, the sort of shorter pastoral phone calls are something that we weren't really doing very much of before. And I think on both sides of it, it's um, there's a bigger uptake of that. So um, I've got a variety of people with experience and skill on the team, and some of them would be reluctant to offer uh, intense counselling but are really keen to kind of just offer a 20 minute phone call that they chat and listen and um, then offer to pray with someone. And I think on the receiving end, quite a lot of people are a bit worried about the counselling word, uh, whereas actually to just think, I'm just going to chat to someone, uh, tell them what's going on in my life and um, know that they're going to be praying for me. There's been a, a quite a big uptake of that. So I think we'll try and continue that um, beyond this time. Yeah. Has lockdown, Sonia, given rise to particular issues in people's lives? Yes, for sure. Um, I think we've had a number of surprises. I don't know how everyone else has found it, but we've been surprised that um, folk who were perhaps previously struggling um, with just the pressure of life, maybe it was showing itself in um, issues like anxiety or depression. I think some of them have found that actually lockdown has provided a, a time of rest, almost jumping off the conveyor belt of life and just um, having a chance to actually slow down and take stock and it's done them good. Um, I think others have found that actually they've now recognised they were running a bit fast before, were perhaps a bit um, overwhelmed with their own plans and uh, liked to be in control. And the whole issue of having that all snatched away has actually raised new issues um, during this time. So there's been differences in that way. Um, I guess it's a biblical principle, isn't it, that uh, in times of pressure and stress, um, we, we get a bit exposed. Um, God uses those times to bring to the surface things that are rumbling in our hearts anyway. And we perhaps get a clearer view of those in times of pressure. Stuff comes out of us um, and it gives us an opportunity to grow in self-awareness, perhaps just thinking through things like um, what are we most fearful of? Um, what, what kind of things in our plans do we feel most thwarted in and why does that matter so much? Um, you know, our deepest fears and longings, I think, have been exposed in some interesting ways during this time. So those certainly have, have come up. And, and do you think that post lockdown, as we begin to come out of that, 
there will be additional issues that are, that are coming to the surface. I'm, I'm thinking particularly in terms of perhaps relationships. Yeah, I think so. Um, one thing I've noticed, well, I'm sure we've all noticed in our own lives, is that there's an intensity uh, to our relationships in on the domestic front that um, has perhaps raised all sorts of interesting issues that were perhaps rumbling along before that have kind of been heated up a bit um, through through this time. Um, and I think also people have been reluctant to necess necessarily share what's really been going on behind closed doors. Um, and so I think we can often misread it as people involved in pastoral ministry, things that might look fine at the moment. I think we might find as people rejoin uh, some sense of community and uh, come back into um, their community of church, that actually we need to be really good listeners for the next few months. Um, people will have a lot that they want to offload about. And I think there'll be a real variety of experiences of lockdown. For some, it will have been um, perhaps the hardest time of their lives. And for others, we'll have sailed through it quite enjoying a slightly slower pace. But we're going to need to be um, super aware, I think, of just the fact that different people will have experienced things very differently. And there may well be quite a sort of tidal wave of emotions that people want to express and um, things that have gone on that they suddenly feel able to share and want to share. So, yeah, I think trust will be an issue, too. Um, you know, I think just on a health front, we're not going to be fully uh, confident that we're safe with each other um, at any dis at any closeness and proximity. And I guess that translates to those deeper issues as well. If we can't really trust each other to be physically close to, um, it's going to be less likely that we're going to be sharing at a deeper level too, I think. Great. Thanks, Sonia. And if perhaps some of those issues of caring have raised issues for you, again, you can send in questions and we'll do our best to get round to some of those later on in the seminar. Now, it's also great that we're joined with uh, Robin Ham. Uh, Robin, it's great to have you with us. Tell, again, tell us again a little bit about your context and where you're serving the Lord. Hey Adrian, thanks. Yeah, we live in a town called Barrow in southwest Cumbria. So if you're coming up to the Keswick Convention, if you exit the M6 at Junction 36 and just keep on driving, you will come to Barrow. And we moved here about five years ago to explore planting a new church with the Church of England as part of what was called the Pioneer Curacy. And Grace Church was basically began from scratch, really, and we've been going two and a half years now, uh, kind of average during that time, maybe sort of 15 to 25 people, that kind of size. And as part of my role here in Barrow, I also co-lead a kind of a, an informal uh, network of churches from different denominations across the town called the Barrow Mission Community. Robin, lots of churches went into lockdown thinking, how can we keep on doing exactly the same things we're doing now, except online? You had a completely different approach. Tell us about that and what happened as a result. Yeah, people have been using that phrase, haven't they? That, you know, we're all facing the same storm, but we're all doing it from different boats. You know, we've all got different situations, different circumstances. And I think for us, the boat, if you like, that we were in as a church was that we'd had quite a difficult six months previously. So we'd said goodbye to some key people in the church who'd moved away. We're only a small church anyway, so we were kind of struggling with that sense of kind of critical mass. Uh, the building that we were renting, uh, we were finding more and more difficult to use. Some of the ministry that we hoped to do there, was, we were becoming more limited so January, February time, we were, we were thinking, OK, what what might we need to radically change in order to kind of um, to do gospel ministry long term? And so for us, to, as, as the kind of the storm came, the storm of, of COVID and lockdown, the, the boat we were in wasn't so much how do we keep everything going? How do we keep the ministry plate spinning? But actually, we've got nothing to lose. Um, we've got nothing to lose. And people sometimes talk about like a Kairos moment, you know, a moment where it feels ripe for change. Um, and and so for us, one of the things we've been uh, praying about and then exploring over the last couple of months really has been whether it might be the right time for, for our church and another church in the town to consider becoming one, to consider kind of merging and joining together. Because this is a time where, you know, we're all throwing everything up in the air. Everything's been thrown up in the air and we're kind of seeing where it lands. Well, why not throw the most kind of fundamental of things than church itself up in the air and think, well, actually, could we do things differently, even in that regard, uh, going forward for the gospel? And in ministry, there's always that danger, isn't there, that you kind of, your identity is bound up 
in, in the ministry. And I think for, for church planting in particular, that's accentuated because, you know, you're involved in starting something and temptation is to think this is this is my baby. And so it's quite vulnerable to think, actually, what if the future of the gospel in this place isn't isn't in this particular church under this particular name? But actually, this is this is the right moment to, to think even beyond that. Um, and so there's almost that sense of, well, if not now, we you know when? Um, and I don't want to preempt any of the conversations, the explorations that the two congregations are having on the ground, but um, it does kind of feel like you can almost trace God's hand in this season, um, and you sort of feel this is this is actually the perfect time to to think outside the box. Uh, Robin, that means you've had some space to think of some new things you could be doing. Tell us what they are and why you've done them. Yeah, I think in some senses it almost felt like we had a we had a blank canvas. We we kind of had our Sunday gathering, which we we obviously wanted to kind of carry on and sustain, but. Um, one of the things that um, I was conscious of early on was the way in which, you know, there was this sense of our lives being disrupted. You know, all the routines and the rhythms that we had were kind of going out the window, uh, you know, going to work, um, church, you know, going to the gym, going to the coffee shop, the school run. It was it was all kind of up in the air. And, it, you know, you can remember how disorientating it felt um, to have all that kind of the, the carpet kind of pulled out from under your feet and, Suddenly this endless stream of information coming through our computer screens and our phones about um, this situation. And it was interesting how quickly uh, new routines and rhythms began to fall into place. So we had the kind of the clap for carers, didn't we? And the, and the kind of the 5 p.m. government briefings and things like Joe Wicks's exercise class. And so one of the things we began to ask well, was, was how as Christians do we kind of almost form a new set of rhythms uh, a new set of rhythms in this kind of lockdown l- landscape. How do we disrupt the disruption, if you like, with with the gospel, with the gospel of grace? And so one of the things I started doing was uh, uh, Monday to Friday, a, a kind of a 1.30 p.m. Bible reflection on Facebook Live, where we just encourage people to kind of tune in, connect in, and we would look at a little bit of the Bible. We called it brew and chew. So the idea was you kind of, you grabbed your brew and you had a chew on God's word together. And we, and we did that each day. We did it at the start of the afternoon. We felt that was a kind of a good slot to kind of just draw people together. And there was that sense of actually giving giving people a rhythm. I mean, that was good for me as a Christian in this kind of this strange landscape. But actually the sense of actually coming together and creating a new rhythm to, to live out the gospel in these disrupted days. And normally we would work through a book of the Bible in that time. We kind of just little by little, often using material that I'd written previously. So it was quite low uh, maintenance in terms of prep time uh, but one of the things actually we did for two weeks was we we looked at rhythms gospel rhythms how to kind of live out this kind of this holy disruption which is what we called it um, so we used John Owen's idea of uh, of our union with Christ something that doesn't change being the basis for our, our communion with God or kind of our daily walk and how we can kind of create rhythms that kind of help us live out that daily walk. So we talked about putting our hope in the rope of God's word at a time when many people are feeling hopeless. We talked about framing our days with prayer and we talked about resisting overwhelm with with rhythms of rest. We talked about kind of turning down the volume of this endless noise and information and kind of making quiet spaces um, to be with God. Uh, and I think certainly, again, for me, it was important to kind of spell that out and to kind of grow those kind of those rhythms and those gospel values in this new landscape. And there's a quote that I love by a, by a writer called Annie Dillard, where she says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And I think uh, it was a really helpful uh, kind of thing to do for us as Christians to think through, well, how do we spend our days in lockdown? How does the gospel shape our days? shape our rhythms but also I think for those looking in it kind of almost gave a kind of a concreteness to um, to kind of a gospel perspective to a, a, a grace perspective to the, the good news of Jesus actually shaping your perspective in this situation. Thanks Robin and again if you want to raise some questions that are perhaps prompted by some of the things that you've heard Robin talk about do send them along and we'll do our best to answer them. 
Well, thank you so much, everybody. It's really great to hear how those different ministry areas have been affected by lockdown life and to begin to ponder what changes might take place as we all emerge out the other side. Uh, we're delighted to have everyone uh, on the line with us now. Hello to Adrian. Hello. Hello, John Hello. and Anna. You're nice on. to great see you. Great to have you here. Where are you joining us from? I'm in Market Harbour, just south of Leicester. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Adrian's going to be chairing our question time. So without any further ado, I will hand you over to Adrian. Thanks, John Tiana. And thank you for leading us so well this week. We've been really blessed by your leadership. So thank you so much. And as you can see, I'm joined by Sonia and Ephraim and Robin. Thank you for your time. We've all done a quick costume change, as you can see from the recorded videos. And this is just a, a short opportunity just to catch up and follow on with some deeper questions. Ephraim, I want, I want to start with you. A few people have been asking questions about this, and I've got a question about it too. It, it looks like live streams are, are here to stay. How, how, how can we as, as, as Christians and churches make the most of live streams going forward? Um, yeah, I, I, I do have that sense also that live streams are here to stay. And I'm in the, the same boat of actually thinking about how do we um, incorporate this into our church life. Um, we've definitely seen benefits of a greater accessibility of um, just the, the, the ministry of the church, people further afield connecting, people who are often on the fringes of church life becoming more consistent in their connection. And I do believe that um, if approached properly and faithfully, it can actually help draw people in from the fringes into the actual physical present life of the church. And so um, I, I think that there's a few things that can be done. I think fundamentally overarching all of it is intentionality, actually being intentional about how we um, use this momentum that we're, we've, we've experienced and I think for people who have been engaging and are continuing to engage with, um, you know, stream services and, and streamed church life, I think the intentionality can look like, first of all, just recognizing that actually um, our gathering together, albeit remotely, is mandated by scripture that as we respond to Hebrews 10, 25, that it exhorts and instructs us not to neglect gathering together um, with the, the believers, even more as we see the, 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 the Lord um, approaching, um, drawing near. Uh, I think that having that intentionality to recognize that um, our time of gathering, even remotely, is, is a, it's a sacred moment when we are joining in the heritage of um, of the church of ages, um, as the people of God, separating ourselves aside from other activities and other duties and other distractions even, and actually devoting ourselves to the Lord um, in worship. And, and you know, uh, it's often been said that Christianity is not a spectator sport, but a, a partaker sport, if you like. And so there's that sense of recognizing that even as we participate in, in gathered worship, um, fellowshipping with one another, albeit remotely, um, there's a sense of consistency with the church of ages. And it's a genuine expression of worship that God delights in. And, you know, sometimes people can kind of get confused by the difference of proximity and presence. Um, you can have somebody in your life who is a very present person in your life, but they're not actually by proximity near to you. They, they, you know, they may be based in another city, another place, but through messaging and through phone calls and so on, you, you have a real sense of their presence in your life. And uh, I think that we will see more of this as Christians, as we're intentional about recognizing that the sacred nature of our fellowship and also, you know, appreciating that it is a poor substitute, as was mentioned. And so not to just give in to convenience and, and kind of become consumer-oriented Christians where we'll just kind of 
you know, switch on, tune in for the moment, and then um, a- allow that to substitute us being able to gather together. Um, it, we, we should endeavor to do our utmost in our worship of the Lord. And if our utmost is, I can only connect remotely at present, then fine. And I think that for those churches that are um, reestablishing physical gatherings, um, there's going to be the consideration of, you know, what does that look like in terms of how we configure uh, our services to actually um, be able to be accessible to a streamed audience. Um, also, some some practicalities for us, we've had to reconfigure our um, meeting space. And so we've got lighting and, you know, everything's kind of really kind of in close proximity to the speaker in order to make that work cameras there and so on and and we're going to have to think through okay how do we now adapt the use of this space and the technology in order to um be able to continue to stream a a decent quality whilst at the same time accommodating those who are gathered so yeah that's some of the thoughts that um we've been wrestling with definitely and that insight about proximity and presence is really important, isn't it? It works the other way around. Just because someone is physically near us doesn't necessarily mean we're close to them. And, and I guess, Sonia, that does raise a question about this kind of mixed mode we're going to be in, that some people are going to be able to meet with us physically. Some people are not going to be allowed to meet. Some people will choose not to meet, perhaps because of anxiety. How do we serve those, especially in the church, who are not able to be with us, either because they're not allowed to or because of perhaps sensitivities? Yeah, I think that's a really significant question, isn't it? We're all going to have to be wrestling with. I guess it's um, slightly different sometimes, uh, thinking about it corporately. Um, My work's mostly one-to-one. And so um, for a lot of people, even those who are very self-protective and need to be at the moment, there are creative ways in which, you know, you can... um, I tried to have a counselling session with a lady in her garden through her window the other day, which, you know, mixed success. But um, trying to work out um, how do we, those of us in ministry are getting excited about the new opportunities we have to actually physically gather. But I guess it's how do we serve each other well and love each other, um, being aware of the sensitivities and concerns that people will have, because some of them are totally rational. You know, there are real risks with us meeting and being close. Um, And some of the concerns are a bit more irrational, but nevertheless need understanding. Mm. So I think there's a sort of important thing that we need to make sure the people we're ministering to have a sense of agency, um, that they're getting to choose how to do it, uh, what they want to do and what they're comfortable with. Um, I think also a sort of case by case approach, you know, who who we're trying to meet with and what are their particular concerns and worries um there are all sorts of complexities particularly with the elderly i think we've heard we've heard a lot about um uh, the the lockdown creating um a sort of a difficulties okay never mind i'll go to robin i'll go to robin instead and perhaps ask him a question and robin you you talk a little bit about holy disruption and and being able to sort of rethink how do you how do you embed that in the life of a church a lockdown's given an opportunity for it but how do you embed it in the life of the church yeah great question i mean i think it's worth saying up front that you know these past four and a half months have just been killer haven't they they've been crazy and so there's this desire to evaluate and reflect and look forward but actually we should also just recognize that we probably need to take it easy as well um so there's been surveys done haven't there about people in ministry saying you know three months ago they felt energized and inspired now they just feel exhausted and so i think it is important to recognize that and you know august is a great time to just turn the volume down on on life uh, on ministry, on on what life looks like, and and just take it easy to to be able to reflect. Um, I guess then, as we do the as the the prayerful reflection, it is it's about having imagination, isn't it? It's about um, seeing beyond the way we've always done things. Um, you know, we have these kind of sacred cows, whether it's at a church level, you know, that service, that course, that meeting, or whether it's even in our individual lives, the way we do family life, our different routines and patterns and things we always do. 
well, in a, in a way that the sacred cows have gone off to market and, you know, which ones do we actually want to bring back? And so I guess it's a, it's a chance to, to be radical, but also recognizing that, um, you know, there's, a, there's an expectation thing, isn't there? Some things will change and some things will want to do differently, but also some things won't change and that's okay. Um, so it's not that we need to completely um, do everything differently, but um, yeah, there's, there's a mix and we've got to manage that expectations. Thanks very much, Robin. Um, Ephraim, let me just go back to you for a moment, just just briefly to ask you a very specific question. Um, we're often thinking about how we help one another. Uh, the leaders of our churches are tired. They're often empty. Are, are there particular things that you would you would say to, to church members and attenders, ways that they can help their leaders at the moment? Um, yeah, I think that there are a few ways. Um, one, I, I, I would just um encourage people to consider carefully their expectations um so often uh, our church leaders are expected to be able to basically be the, the the jack of all trades and master of them all and so you know okay church is in lockdown so we're going to go to stream and why aren't we in streaming why does the stream look like that and then okay church is going to reopen so how comes we're not open yet and so i, I think people's expectations um can just just you know reevaluating them and reflecting on them can be really helpful because it then shapes our attitude and our posture towards our leaders um i think also um just being encouraging and supportive um and all of that in addition to really praying with a, with a consistency um because uh, our leaders do carry a great weight um, at the best of times, and then especially when things get really challenging, um, you know, a, a small word of encouragement goes a long way. Any leader would tell you that, and so I, I would definitely um, advocate that. This is normal, really, just in in ever increasing Absolutely. measure. Um, you, you talked about times being tough there, um, Sonia. I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier on was about how um, it, it's often in times of stress that we learn things and the Lord really does business with us. Can you say a little bit more about that? Because often when times get difficult, we just kind of hunker down, don't we? Kind of, you know, shut the doors and put up the protective barriers. How do, how do we learn the discipline of learning from those times and growing as Christians? Well, I'm no expert, but I'm, I guess it's just the same for all the children of God everywhere, isn't it? It's that whole, as we let him shine the light of his word into our lives and our hearts, um, we see some of the areas in which we um, struggle under pressure. I think, um, you know, anxiety and fear are coming to the fore again as, as, as lockdown is easing and people are beginning to re-emerge and regather. Um, there are different senses of perhaps overexcitement and people perhaps taking risks that are unnecessary. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, people so fearful about what might, what might be ahead that they're kind of holding back and not wanting to meet. Um, so I think it's that sort of we are relying on the fact that the Lord is working individually with people um, independently of the gatherings that actually by his word and through his spirit, um, his, his disciples are growing um, in all sorts of ways in this time, just because the doors are shut physically in church. Um, the gospel doors are wide open and people are still being sanctified and changed day by day. So I think times of pressure we often want to hide from them and resist them but usually God's doing something quite important with each one of us so yeah talking about it I think sharing those experiences is going to be encouraging for all of us. Great uh, Sonia the question I wanted to ask you before just before we were, were cut off was just and it'll have to be a brief answer I'm afraid it's just about those particularly with mental health needs we've heard a lot about how that is an increasing problem are there, are there one or two things that we should be aware of as Christians as we try and serve one another? Yeah, I think one of the important things is to um, enable those struggling in those areas to feel that they have a sense of choice about how they're going to meet with people. We don't want to sort of force people into situations where they might feel uncomfortable, even if um, on paper there's no apparent risk. Um, actually loving each other well and sacrificially and needing to be patient with people as we try and um, engage with them in meaningful ways in ministry. That might mean we keep going with sort of very virtual and online um, encounters for much longer than we might otherwise. That's OK. Um, trying to um, understand very much how how it's feeling in their from their perspective um, 
I don't know, I'm, I'm quite slow at that, needing to take time just to get what it actually feels like from somebody else's perspective, um, something I need lots of help with. So I think that's where you start, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we, we've had a quite a lot of questions about the kind of the, the detail of, of meeting together again, whether it's about singing or how a live stream might work or what kind of evangelistic opportunities uh, you could uh, take hold of. We haven't really got time to address those. Uh, just to say there are lots of places where you can get free information. Evangelical Alliance got some good information on evangelism. Baptist Union is great for, they've got some templates for how to get your building ready. Um, we at the FIEC have got lots of, um, uh, seminars and webinars online about leadership and tackling all those kinds of things. So um, we don't need to do them now. There are lots of resources around your local diocese, if you're in an Anglican church, will have produced guidance as well. So do just have a hunt around, do ask other people. You'll find that probably there are not questions that you've, you're thinking about in church life that have not been thought about by, by someone else. Um, I, I want to thank Ephraim and Robin and Sonia. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you so much for your insights. I hope it's been helpful. I'm going to finish the time by praying before I hand back to John T and Anna. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you for the hope of the gospel held out to us in Jesus Christ. Thank you for Christ Church Forward and Ecclesia in Lewisham and, and Grace Church in Barrow. Thank you for every church that's represented by people who have been tuning in. And Father, we want to pray that whether it's through lockdown or not we want to pray we would be churches which are hearing god's word listening to you carefully we want to pray heavenly father we are be churches of transformation where we're becoming like god's son and we want to pray that you be using us in your service so that we are serving your mission please hear our prayer please answer our prayer for we pray in the precious and mighty name of jesus our savior amen and now back to john t and anna in the pencil factory well, thank you so much, uh, Adrian. Thank you to Ephraim and Robin and Sonia as well. There's a lot to think about there, Good isn't there? Nice, as nice. we um, consider our expectations moving into what they were saying is probably going to be a mixed mode phase of church and that proximity and presence thing, how we uh, serve others and love others well in this phase. Well, thank you very much to you for joining us for our seminar this morning. It's been great to have you with us. Uh, we're not finished here. Do stay tuned for the Count Everyone In a session. Pete and Christine Windmill and the team will be bringing you a final short devotion that's accessible for all aimed at helping those with learning disabilities. And we've got our evening celebration coming up tonight and the final youth stream celebration as well, both at eight o'clock tonight. And don't forget that everything that you've seen and heard this week is available online for you to watch again. Go to the VKC website to check that out. Maybe if you've been particularly encouraged by something, why not share it with a friend or a family member or a colleague? And that just leaves uh, me to say from Anna and I, um, goodbye. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you with us. And we hope to see you again, God willing, next year for Keswick 2021. Goodbye and enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>